Hello, and welcome to SD WAN, Market Trends, Early Success, and Real World Lessons. I'm Adam Dennison, publisher of CIO and your host and moderator for this panel discussion. Thank you for joining us today. In this discussion, we will provide you a market overview of SD WAN. What is it? What are the business benefits? And where are businesses on the adoption cycle right now? Additionally, we will share real examples of SD WAN in action from a peer perspective. I'd like to introduce today's panelists. First, we have John Burke, Principal Research Analyst and CIO, Nemerides Research. Welcome, John. Thanks, Adam. Glad to be here. We also have Andy Leong, Director of Product Marketing for SD WAN at Citrix. Welcome, Andy. Thanks, Adam. Great to be here. And finally, we have Dave Wirtz, Senior Network Architect at Northside Hospital in Atlanta. Welcome, Dave. Thanks. Glad to be here. So before we begin today's presentation and discussion, I want to provide you with a few housekeeping items. First, all of the windows you see on your screen are customizable. This means you have control over the layout of the webcast. You can resize any of the windows by clicking and dragging the windows from the edges or corners. If you happen to close any of the windows, the icons in the taskbar at the bottom of your screen will open them again immediately. You can ask questions at any time by using the Q&A window. Just type your question into the ask a question field and then click the submit button. We encourage your questions, so please take advantage of this and we will answer as many as we can toward the end of the discussion. If you have any issues with the video, audio, or slides during the webcast, the best troubleshooting advice there is to simply refresh your browser. If you need further technical assistance, submit a question in the Q&A window, then expand that window to make sure you can see the response. The slides for today's presentation are available for download in the handouts window. And last but not least, at the end of the webcast, I will let you know how you can be eligible to win an Amazon Echo Show. Now, for a high-level overview of the SD-WAN technology, market overview, and opportunity, I will turn it over to John Burke of Nemerides. Thanks very much, Adam. And as I say, a real pleasure to be here and have a chance to talk about SD-WAN. This is a subject uh, close to my heart. been studying it for a few years now. Um, I'll uh, start, though, by introducing Nemerides, the company that I work for, and uh, explaining the source of the data that you'll see presented through the rest of uh, my session, or my part of the session. And, and then uh, we'll discuss what we mean when we talk about SD-WAN, and uh, as Adam was saying, lay out some of the things that we're seeing about the adoption of SD-WAN in the enterprise currently. So about Nemertes, we're a research and strategic consulting firm, and we're focused on analyzing and quantifying the business value that people get by deploying emerging technologies, things like SD-WAN. Um, we've been in business since 2002. I came on board in 2005 after spending about uh, 18, 19 years doing IT uh, in an enterprise context. Uh, for the last several years now, I've been studying the deployment of SD-WAN technologies in the enterprise and uh, trying to understand better exactly what people are trying to do by deploying SD-WAN. And in order to understand why it's become so uh, attractive in the marketplace, so popular so quickly, uh, it's important to understand the sort of legacy WAN environment that folks are working to uh, not just uh, fix, but to uh, entirely replace with something that can much better serve their needs going forward. So uh, the legacy WAN built primarily around private WAN connectivity in the form of MPLS uh, currently um, is very router centric. Uh, every site has its routers. Every router is maintained basically uh, like a unique individual. So. Uh, uh, although there may be some kind of golden router uh, operating system image, uh, every router is uh, manually loaded with that software and then manually tweaked to be uniquely suited to the unique configuration required in its site. Each link coming into it from a carrier also managed uniquely. And all of these uh, manual processes make the uh, work of maintaining these legacy routers uh, repetitive for IT staff, error prone, and really labor intensive. And the fact that it's so easy to uh, introduce small problems in configuration when you're working across a large number of routers 
uh, leads to both security and uh, uh, service provision issues. Uh, either services fail, behave erratically, or uh, there are problems with the compromisability of the routers. And because it's so private WAN focused, because it's so focused on MPLS, which is the most costly option in the market typically, um, folks are provisioning as little bandwidth at any given site as they think they can get away with. Bandwidth is scarce. And so the introduction of new services to the WAN is always something that's looked at with some uh, caution and the uh, use of internet resources uh, imposes sort of a double tax on the organization in that uh, although traffic is destined for a, a cloud resource, uh, it has to be backhauled through that private WAN connectivity into a data center and then from the data center out to the cloud and then back along the same path. So it's chewing up bandwidth to and from the data center all to get services that are basically not involving the data center. Um, and also, again, as a side effect, primarily of the expense of the main connectivity technology that's in use, uh, most branches only have a single active link uh, going at any given moment. And if they have a second link, either internet or MPLS, it's there as a failover measure only. It's not usable in normal circumstances. And the failover that's typically set up in these places is either manual requiring IT to step in and shift something uh, in the software or automatic but relatively slow so that all of the traffic, all of the uh, application sessions that were in progress across that link, if it dies, those, those sessions also die. And even though there's a redundant link available and IT is switching traffic over to it, maybe with uh, automation, uh, every, every application has to restart its communications. Every uh, user has to restart whatever it is that they were doing when their sessions died. Uh, and uh, typically having multiple links is limited to having an MPLS link and an internet link. It's very rare to have redundancy beyond those two links. It's very rare uh, to actually have physical redundancy in the, in the mix as well. So oftentimes those two links will come from the same provider or along the same physical pathway. Uh, and of course, uh, the, the last uh, major characteristic of the legacy WAN that's really hurting these days, hurting IT, is that routers are basically blind to applications. And because applications are where the users live all the time, that's where business gets done. Uh, that blindness makes it difficult for IT to, for instance, make meaningful SLAs when they're talking with the business. So in contrast to all that, with that as the backdrop, uh, we look forward and say, what does the WAN need to be? With the uh, sharp rise in the use of cloud resources, it needs to be cloud friendly. It needs to be able to send traffic directly to the cloud from the branch and only send things to the data center that need to go there. It needs to be accepting of private WAN backbones, but not require them in order to deliver uh, uh, services with good performance, with good reliability, with good resilience. Uh, and in fact, being friendly to internet connectivity as a primary uh, method of communicating uh, will drive down bandwidth costs in the branch tremendously. Uh, because we're living in an age of uh, steadily increasing workloads in IT, but not steadily increasing staff, uh, we need for the new WAN to be uh, managed centrally and to further embrace automation so that it can cost IT less to maintain the wide area network and uh, allow the network to be uh, less error prone and more secure because uh, automation provides consistency and speed and responsiveness in the face of a need to, to change configurations. And lastly, and very importantly, we need the new WAN to understand applications sort of natively. We, we don't wanna have to continue to layer on multiple uh, pieces of management software on top of our infrastructure in order to understand the uh, applications flowing across that infrastructure and the use they're making of it. So that's where SD-WAN comes into the picture. SD-WAN is meant to uh, take all of those problems with the legacy WAN and uh, address them, make the WAN ready for that future uh, facing scenario. So at its base, uh, it is about a, a centralized and holistic management environment so that IT, 
uh, manages the WAN, manages the network, and not all of the individual devices. The, the devices are handled by the solution. Uh, IT manages the solution. Uh, it, it's like managing a field of corn instead of uh, a bunch of prize roses. Nothing gets individual attention. But um, equally important in providing the kind of uh, always up connectivity with a, a lot of capacity available for applications is SD-WAN's ability to make use of all of the connectivity that's available in a location simultaneously and to balance traffic across the different links that are available to it, whether they be private WAN connectivity uh, like MPLS or an internet link, whether they be wired or 4G or satellite provided, uh, SD-WAN will take all of it and use all of it simultaneously. Equally important to providing that kind of resilience and the kind of performance that people need in their applications, the ability to make promises about that performance uh, is that an SD-WAN solution will actively monitor the health of all of the links that are coming into it and transparently, without requiring the intervention of IT directly, transparently reroute application traffic when trouble develops on one of the links that is feeding into the location. If a link dies, all of the traffic will fail across to live links, uh, according to the priorities laid down with policies. And most solutions can handle that failover in a short enough time that active sessions won't, uh, not only won't die, but they won't even have a noticeable interruption of service. And that ability to protect the performance of important services is critical in understanding, again, why SD-WAN is so uh, rising in popularity so quickly, uh, because you can set up policies that uh, basically prioritize applications, uh, indicating which ones are most important to the business and the conduct of the business, and giving them guarantees for uh, a minimum amount of bandwidth or for a minimum level of performance. And as long as it's possible to deliver that over whatever mix of links is currently active, then that traffic will get that protection, will get uh, delivered according to those requirements. And your business users can have a, a meaningful SLA with IT because you can talk about the performance of specific applications. Now that ability to um, basically divide the application traffic on the network up into different classes of traffic and handle those classes independently of each other uh, essentially means that you can create a, a set of virtual wide area networks overlaid on top of the physical infrastructure. And you can segment traffic for different applications, for different users, for different groups of users or sites uh, according to those policies and uh, keep the traffic from uh, destined for one uh, set of users or set of sites uh, or set of applications entirely separate logically from the traffic destined for the others. So you can uh, segregate, you can segment the traffic on the network for security reasons as well as performance and prioritization reasons. And that ability to create all these overlay WANs not only gives you that ability to segment for security and performance, but also to uh, segment according to the uh, architectural needs of different applications. Uh, some applications like uh, VoIP or video conferencing want to have direct connectivity site to site, and you can set those traffic classes up so that when uh, it's generated in one branch, it will directly go to the other branch across the internet, across the MPLS cloud, whatever's available. Um, you can also though set up different overlays so that, uh, for example, if it's a messaging application and you're in a financial services industry and it needs to go through uh, a DLP or an archiving application that's back in one of your data centers, you can set up other overlay WANs so that uh, they route the traffic that way in a more traditional hub and spoke style, but only the applications that need that and not the ones that don't. 
And that ability, coupled with the fact that uh, you're almost always using internet links as a part of your pool of connectivity at a branch, uh, makes SD-WAN very cloud friendly because you can selectively, uh, by application, by destination out there in the cloud, by user or group of users or by site, uh, direct traffic straight out through the internet link and to the cloud without routing back through a data center or through another branch location. Uh, and that ability to directly send traffic out to the cloud lets you take advantage of all of the optimizations that all those cloud providers have put in place to make their applications perform uh, very well for users coming in across the internet. They have extremely broadly uh, distributed points of presence across the, the worldwide uh, internet. And so getting directly to the internet is often the fastest way, the best way for performance purposes to get to those cloud destinations, which makes SD-WAN extremely cloud friendly and uh, basically freed from all of the kinds of limitations that we're beginning to really pinch the enterprise in this age of cloud, in this age of rapid introduction of new WAN based services in this, you know, for the purposes of digital transformation or other things. And so, uh, uh, again, no surprise, uh, it's become an extraordinarily popular kind of a solution, oops, very quickly, uh, with, you know, although it's only two or three years old already, almost a quarter of enterprises having adopted it uh, in Q3 of 2018, when we did this last round of research, uh, and another 17% plus planning on deploying it yet in 2018. So we should be around 40% of enterprises now beginning this uh, migration for themselves, with another 20% planning on getting launched with SD-WAN in 2019 this year. We've seen that uh, the do-it-yourself approach where IT buys the solution, deploys the solution, and manages the solution uh, accounts for about 70% of the market currently, uh, with about 30% using some sort of uh, either carrier-provided or carrier-managed uh, solution instead. And uh, that is uh, pretty impressive considering that two years ago, uh, that figure was more like 10%. So this is uh, definitely something we're seeing in the marketplace going forward, a, a rise in the use of managed solutions. Sorry, I'm having troubles with my previous and next buttons here. Um, so we're also seeing that in addition to uh, just the core route, uh, router-based functionality that folks were relying on, uh, in their branch offices, uh, that they're looking to SD-WAN to do more. Uh, certainly most of them want SD-WAN solutions to replace their routers. A solid majority want it in either SOM, about 60%, or, or uh, I'm sorry, uh, in SOM, about 20%, or all, about 60% of their locations. Uh, but they're also looking to SD-WAN solutions to uh, replace their branch firewalls and replace their WAN optimizers in their branches. Uh, and again, the numbers run 75% uh, plus wanting to replace some or all of their firewalls, some or all of their WAN optimizers. And with WAN optimizers, it's no surprise. Uh, a lot of folks put WAN optimizers in to get around the fact that they had to, you know, essentially conduct uh, the, the torrential flood of cloud-based business that they needed to conduct through the soda straw of their MPLS connection and you know, opening up the floodgates with, uh, with internet connectivity, much less expensive bandwidth at the branch, uh, relieves the need for WAN optimization for many of those people as a result. Many of the rest of the folks using WAN optimizers were looking to it for prioritization. Again, mainly because bandwidth was scarce, but also because they just had a, a very uh, clear hierarchy of needs with respect to what got bandwidth and what didn't. That also the SD-WAN solution can provide and so, no surprise, uh, WAN optimizers high on the list to get uh, replaced with SD-WAN. More surprising firewalls, but folks are looking at the abilities of SD-WAN solutions, not just to provide some baseline firewall functionality per se, but also to segregate traffic and direct it away from places it doesn't need to go, uh, to direct it selectively to places where it can get more security applied to it, their data centers, uh, or over which kind of links it can travel, and thinking that that may replace their uh, current branch firewall strategy. 
And MPLS, uh, another thing that private connectivity that is the uh, backbone of most uh, enterprise WANs, it, it's not going away immediately, but we are seeing some dramatic shifts in how many people are planning on keeping it and how much they're planning on keeping. Um, <clears throat> uh, a, a couple of years ago, when we first asked this question, uh, 80 plus percent of the folks that we asked said, uh, we are gonna keep all the, S, uh, all the MPLS that we've got and we're gonna make it all a part of our, our, our SD-WAN solution. We're seeing a much more nuanced approach now and certainly more people uh, who are willing to give up some or all of the MPLS that they've got in place because they're seeing that they can get the levels of performance, the levels of reliability that they want and that they have been looking to MPLS to deliver out of an SD-WAN solution using internet connectivity and uh, not requiring an MPLS backbone or requiring a, a smaller one or requiring one that goes only to some of their sites and not all of their sites. So we see a very uh, nuanced approach to MPLS uh, evolving as SD-WAN continues to mature and spread further in the market. Uh, we still don't expect it to just go away anytime soon. It's got another seven to 10 years of life in the front of it at least, but the capacity in which it's being used uh, is definitely going to be shifted uh, and shifted dramatically as a result of uh, the rollout of SD-WAN. And that is reflected in uh, some part by another factor we're seeing, which is a shift to internet only connectivity. Uh, whereas uh, as people were kicking off many of these projects in uh, mid 2018, uh, they had only well a, a little under a quarter of their sites connected only with internet uh, bandwidth. Uh, they're looking to have closer to 40% connecting internet only uh, by next year. And that's a dramatic and uh, really market shaking kind of uh, a change uh, if you're uh, an MPLS provider, especially. Uh, it'll provide some nice downward price pressure on MPLS and make people even uh, more free to make the use of MPLS that they need and uh, not be uh, tied down to it when they don't actually need it. So that's really what we're seeing in the market around uh, the adoption of SD-WAN. It's going very quickly and people are making a lot of choices in this next uh, six months to a year about how they're going to approach it. And uh, really that's, that's where I'll hand back off to Adam. Great. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Thank you very much, John. That was a, a, a very in-depth and educational overview. And I can tell you from uh, our perspective here at IDG, uh, we're certainly seeing a lot more uh, being written about uh, from an SD-WAN perspective, primarily through our Network World brand. But we're seeing an awful lot of page views and, and searches coming in around SD-WAN as the adoption cycle tends to, uh, to get an uptick here. Um, Andy, before we hear from Dave in terms of what he's doing at Northside Hospital with uh, with SD WAN, uh, can you give us a, a you know a, your perspective on what John just shared with us uh, and the Citrix sort of overview and, and response to what John just shared with us, please? Yeah, thanks, Adam. So great insights, John, in terms of some of the drivers, the benefits, as well as use cases of SD WAN. These are consistent with what our customers are seeing out there. And I find it really interesting in terms of <clears throat> the Nemerti's point of view, in terms of the growth of MPLS. The bottom line is as much as SD-WAN can actually replace MPLS with internet general purpose connectivity, it is really an augmentative approach to that. And so a lot of our customers are basically saying, well, well MPLS, if we must, but ideally with SD-WAN, we want to basically go to a general purpose internet, as you touched upon, 4G LTE satellite, uh, dedicated internet access type connectivity to get more out of our WAN. Um, and so certainly we are seeing the same traction that you guys are observing in terms of industry customer-wide interest. Um, and you know, the bottom line is <clears throat> this offering immense opportunity for network operations teams to really elevate their strategic value within their organizations. As we all know, a lot of organizations, industries are going through this whole digital transformation. And really the network is a key enabler to that. If you think about the things that John touched upon, the WAN change out, the application performance, the security, the cloud, these are all underlying elements and enablers of a enterprise-wide 
transformation. And so certainly SD-WAN um, is really that sharp tool in the hands of network operation teams to really um, assert more strategic value within their organizations. And so a little bit on Citrix, we've been around for about 30 years and some of you in the audience may know us for our digital workspace applications and virtualization products. Uh, we've partnered with well over 400,000 organizations, leaders in healthcare, in manufacturing, banking, finance, insurance, as well as other industry verticals. And so while some of you and much of the industry may know of us for these application workspace solutions, <clears throat> we also complement that with a robust networking portfolio within which SD-WAN is a key focal area. And so because of our lineage in developing applications, <coughs> we really built our SD-WAN to optimize those applications. And so whether organizations in healthcare or other industries are looking at optimizing the performance and experience for applications that reside in the data center, whether they're shifting to public cloud environments, running across hybrid cloud environments, or just running strictly in SaaS environments, we offer capabilities that actually enhance that end user experience and Really, we look at it as our SD-WAN was optimized to deliver and accelerate applications. And also because increasingly the enterprise edge is extending into the cloud, we offer comprehensive security, which means we can protect not only the applications, but also the network and resources that traverse the cloud and various um, hybrid environments as well. And we combine that with automation to make things easier for network operations teams to provision and manage these services. And beyond that, we offer, because these environments are extending into the cloud, whether it's a multi-cloud environment, whether it's SaaS, we offer connectivity options for customers such that they can roll out SD-WAN in various environments such as IaaS or PaaS. If they want a SaaS we can offer that, and I'll get to that um, a little bit uh, later here. But these are the pillars of what makes Citrix as a SD-WAN solution different. And so while we do have the fundamental converged WAN edge capabilities that John spoke about, the routing, the WAN optimization, security, our focus is really enabling customers to get better application experience. And ultimately, we know that drives better efficiency, better productivity. But rather than have a vendor talk about their solution, what I'd like to do is hand the floor over to one of our partners in the healthcare industry. And so Northside Hospital is both a leader and innovator when it comes to um, not only offering services to their patients and customers, but also when it comes down to how they architect network. And so with that, let me hand things over to you, Dave. Hey, Andrew, thanks. Uh, appreciate y'all having us here today. Um, so yeah, Northside Hospital, we're probably one of the largest hospital uh, organizations in the, in the north side of Atlanta. <clears throat> Um, we deliver, as an organization, we deliver about 27,000 children per year. We're known as the Baby Factory. So we've got uh, three main hospitals. We've got several, I think we're bordering now on about 150 uh, what we call physician practices or, um, oh, I forgot what the, the clinician practices out in the field. So small branch offices, things like that. So we have, we have our primary hospital facilities. Uh, with acute care, we have large MOB facilities, which are, uh, you know, large medical office buildings, multi-tenant office buildings, and then we have our, our ambulatory small practices. The small practices is where we really targeted uh, our SD-WAN deployment. We're currently still in our quote-unquote phase one of the deployment. Um, we came in, I came into Northside about two years ago from an SD-WAN. I was an SE in the SD-WAN space for several years and uh, came in and, and when I saw what the infrastructure looked like, what we were doing with the technologies that we had, as you can see uh, on the slide here, we had we had a, a rather eclectic collection of uh, connectivity to point circuits, um, VPN, and 
well as uh, we had this layer two AT&T switched ethernet. And we, have, we also have uh, what's not pictured on here is another Comcast L2 VPN. Um, and trying to manage all of these various forms of connectivity within our data center, within the routing profile that we had. Um, when I first looked at it, I'm like, how, how have you guys been doing this for, for this long and uh, in actually keeping it operational? Um, some of the things that we had, you know, some of our big challenges were on these L2 networks. Um, AT&T specifically has in their contract, at least with us, you can only have 255 MAC addresses on this L2 network. And if we ever exceed it, they run a script. That script prunes off uh, an arbitrary number of MAC addresses. So in doing so, uh, AT&T has on occasion pruned off 30% of our attached WAN sites. So that turns into a fairly bad day for my, you know, myself and, and my engineering staff as well. We have to sit there and, you know, we spend multiple hours trying to figure out what just happened. What did AT&T do? Why are these sites down? All the while fielding tickets, calls from doctors, et cetera, et cetera. So again, as I said, I spent two years as an SE in the SD-WAN space. It just seemed like a very natural progression and coming in, um, I was not an S I was not an SE for Citrix. So I had to compete against them. I knew what was in the DNA and it just made a, it, it was just a no brainer decision to say, we're going to do SD-WAN. Yeah. We'll compare it on paper. We'll, we'll look at other, we'll look at other vendors on paper, but it just made sense to go with Citrix knowing full well what what's in the DNA of the, uh, the Citrix SD-WAN appliance. So what we've started doing, as I said, we're in phase one right now. We've got about eight sites right now deployed and we're getting ready to hit our, our hockey stick of the deployment. I know we have nine additional sites going up in the next 30 days. Um, again, 150 sites that we plan on converting in the next give or take 20 to 28 months or so, depending on depending on the circuit, uh, when the circuits term out. So we're not we're not going into this and saying we're going to buy 150 SD WAN appliances and hey guys guess what you're going to roll them out in the next 30 days. We're taking a, a fairly pragmatic approach. You know, hey, when the circuit terminates, when the circuit comes to contract, we're just going to roll into the SD WAN, uh, roll that site into our SD WAN overlay. And what we're finding is when we purchase the hardware, we term out the the L2 circuit and we bring in just pure internet circuits. We are running all of these ambulatory sites on just a pair of broadband circuits right now. Our return on investment, which was the biggest selling point for the whole thing, our return on investment for some of these sites is under six months. So when it came time to ask for money, it was it, it just, again, goes back. It was a no brainer for everybody. It was like, we, we're, we're making money after six months on all this stuff. So we've taken everything right now. Uh, we, we've, we've got a few risks that we've acknowledged. You know, obviously one, we are, we are a single head end in our primary data center. Our primary data center happens to be in a very large colo where we have tons of bandwidth, power's not a problem, cooling's not a problem. So it, it just, the risk was minimal to put it there. At the branch sites, again, dual broadband circuits were, were the initial rollout and one of the things that we found were some of the broadband carriers, uh, you know, they may go through a central pop uh, or a, a shared service pop. Uh, and we had an issue early on where we lost a couple sites. Both of them went down. They were hard down for a couple hours. Uh, and we took it. We, we kind of made a shift to bring in LTE radios on our SD-WAN appliances at the branch office now as well. So fortunately, Citrix has the, the their small end little Soho appliance that we roll out it can accommodate multiple you know, hardwired connectivity, but it also has built in LTE radios. So now we are just simply dropping, you know, a pair of broadband circuits and an LTE radio at this branch. We have prioritized our traffic on the branch such that if we lose our primary connectivity and we do have to fail over to broadband, we just say, hey, listen, you know, VoIP and our um, business critical traffic are the only things permitted on that path. So, um, that has been a win-win for us, uh, you know, in terms of rolling it out. We've been able to prioritize our EMR traffic, things like that, using the built-in features that are within SD-WAN, some of the native built-in features uh, like packet duplication. So uh, our EMR is a cloud-hosted EMR. I need to be able to provide the best experience for my physicians that I can. And in doing so, uh, by, by doing packet duplication for our EMR traffic, if I lose a path, if I lose anything, it's really a non-issue. Our EMR is Citrix based. So the fact that I can now use Citrix, the Citrix appliance, being that 
Citrix obviously knows that what's inside that ICA packet, I can now prioritize my traffic based on the contents of the ICA frame itself. So I can prioritize keystroke over screen refresh, things like that. So we're leveraging a lot of that technology within uh, within our deployment here at Northside. VoIP, VoIP and EMR being the two keys that we are that we're focusing in on. And as I said, you know, we are we're eight sites, nine sites if you including the the one that I'm working on right now over our from my house to this presentation. Uh, it is over, you know, our Citrix SD WAN overlay. Uh, we have another nine going out in the next 30 days. So we're we anticipate doubling the size of our overlay in the next 30 days. And who knows uh, what the size is going to be after that. But the key drivers for us were, number one, the cost reduction. Again, return on investment was under six months for a lot of these. And in one case, I know that the ROI was two months based on the circuit cost that we were replacing <clears throat> because the, the the site, the physical location of the site was up in rural North Georgia. In order for me to get an L2 VPN circuit to that particular site, I had to go through two different carrier pops, which now my, you know, my last mile charge went through the roof in doing so. I've been able now to get rid of that, get rid of that and just go pure broadband with an LTE backup. And again, two months factor in, you know, just two months on the CapEx. Um, that was the easiest decision that anybody in the organization ever had to make. So from, from our perspective, uh, this has been, you know, an absolutely, it's just been the best thing that we could possibly have done. As you see on the slide, we've simplified our WAN down to, you know, from four different, uh, transport technologies on just this portion of our WAN for these ambulatory sites down to one and one with virtually zero downtime. Um, we push code during the day. I was I was pushing uh, some config changes this morning. Not one person had any clue what was going on that we were making changes to their site to accommodate. Uh, you know, I think in one case we made a change to one particular site's QoS policy. The they had no idea. Zero interruption, zero downtime. Everything just started working better for them. Um, so it's been an, an absolute win-win for us uh, in every aspect. I'll go ahead. That's great. Back over. Yeah, Dave, that, that's great. Thanks for the uh, overview. You guys are certainly out in the forefront uh, of, of the SD-WAN uh, movement right now and, and making things happen at Northside. Uh, we have some time now to take some questions, and we have a pretty active uh, audience here, so I want to get right to these. Uh, the first one, actually, David, is for you, and, and I like this. They're, they're kind of getting direct here. Um, so how many, uh, how many vendors did you bring into the consideration set, uh, and then what did that look like as far as the, the, the time frame that you uh, – that, that you um, you know went through before you made that decision, and what really kind of tipped the tipped the scales in the Citrix's uh, favor? Sure. So you know we brought in, we looked at them on paper. We looked at three on paper. We kind of narrowed it down. You know, there's 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 a little bit of research out there in terms of the magic quadrant. There, there's not an official SD WAN magic quadrant as as of yet. Um, but again, I can't. I as I said, I was an SE in the SD WAN space, so I was I was. To say that I was very familiar with the SD-WAN landscape is, is an understatement. So I was able to narrow it down immediately down to three. I think we, we initially started with four and narrowed it down to three on paper. And from just the paper spec alone, we're able to narrow it down to Citrix. We're already a Citrix shop. Our EMR was is Citrix based. So just those, those two components alone, the fact that it's Citrix based on the EMR and the the appliance had the ability to, you know, decrypt or, or, or unencapsulate that ICA frame and prioritize the individual streams within the ICA frame really kind of sealed the deal on Citrix to, to in terms of how long we spent doing the research, I would probably say we did maybe three weeks uh, putting together, you know, we put together a product matrix with, you know, green, yellow, red, what, what met the criteria, what didn't. Um, and I think within the entire, uh, product matrix that we put together, I think Citrix got a yellow on one out of maybe 14 criteria. And it really wasn't, it wasn't a one, it, it was a, it was, it was one category, but it wasn't one that was overly critical. Um, whereas the others that we were comparing against just, you know, one, one was more red than they were anything else. And the other one was kind of a 50, 50 mix. And then you, you compound it with, Hey, we're a Citrix shop. Our, our EMR is ICA. It was a done deal. Got it. Uh, I have another question uh, back to you, Dave, again on this one. Uh, did you consider uh, having a service provider for a managed SD-WAN service? We talked about it briefly. Um, again, 
I go, I keep going back to, you know, because I was in SE in the space, I was pretty familiar with how each, you know, how the SD-WAN overlay operated. So I was able to, to train up my team. We've got a fairly good sized team. Um, and I was actually able to train up one of our probably most at, at that point in time, one of our most junior engineers. And I was able to have him up and running and operating our SD-WAN in probably less than a month. And he's now our key go-to guy. Uh, in terms of deploy, you know, new deployments, any any changes to the virtual path, QoS policies, things like that. So, um, yeah, well, while we talked about it just to get the uh, to get the burden of managing the SD WAN overlay off of our plate, it just didn't seem to make sense. Knowing what I knew about SD WAN as a whole and how easy it is to manage it, it just it for for us at Northside, it did not make sense to 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 vendor it out to a managed service provider. Got it. Thank you. Uh, we have another question that just came in um, regarding uh, specific verticals. I'm going to shoot this one over to both uh, John uh, as well as Andy. John, did you see any uh, specific uh, you know, changes or uh, separation between specific verticals in the research that you're conducting around SD-WAN? And then Andy, can you make some comments in terms of where you might be seeing some uh, you know, early attractors, uh, early traction, early adopters as far as your customer set uh, around specific verticals there? Uh, sure. Thanks, Adam. Um, some differentiation on verticals, but really not about the vertical per se, but about the kind of organization it is within the vertical. So organizations that have bigger and wider flung WANs tend to be way more interested in SD-WAN than folks with smaller or, or more localized or regional WANs. Uh, so within financial services, uh, you know, you're looking primarily at consumer facing organizations, ones that have a lot of bank branches, a lot of ATMs, uh, a lot of investment offices facing consumer investors. But like your investment banks, they're not going to go there uh, in retail. You're looking for the folks who have lots and lots of locations, typically not the you know, I've got a half a dozen stores kind of folks typically. So gas stations, convenience stores love SD-WAN not just because it makes their lives easier, but because it can make their connectivity so much less expensive. Um, so yeah, we, we see some differentiation, but it tends to be about how common that distributed operation model is in that vertical. And there are a few verticals like um, uh, K-12 education, where certainly they're you know spread out enough, uh, but because they've handled their connectivity in distinctly different ways than businesses have in the past, they're not as quick to be jumping into this space. Uh, they're still coming, but not as quickly. Got it. Thank you. And Andy, what about you in terms of what you're seeing with your customer set? Yeah, I would just say that there is a direct correlation between the customer's industry with respect to their pace of innovation, with respect to um, you know the customer that they serve and the adoption of SD-WAN. So as an example, if you look at healthcare, you look at the banking, finance, and insurance industries, significant innovation occurring. And also there's a lot of M&A activity. <clears throat> and what happens when M&A occurs at the business level? It means the NetApp guys like Dave actually have more issues and problems on their hands. I mean, certainly fixable with SD-WAN, but that means they need to incorporate new sites and new divisions, get more employees online, get them onto a common network. And so what we're seeing is in certain industries like finance and um, manufacturing, as, as well as um, uh, healthcare, that there is a direct correlation between the pace of innovation, M&A activity, and the adoption or embrace of SD-WAN. Whereas, as John points out, in education or government, for that matter, there isn't that drive or voracious pace of innovation. So therefore, they're beginning to kick the tires. They're realizing because you know they too um, converse at the CIO level, they look at what their peers and other industries are doing. They recognize that SD-WAN is the future, but there isn't that immediate catalyst to go and do it in the next six months. And so over time, we do see you know that migration across these other industries, but certainly the early adopters tend to be the ones who are very fast on the innovation pace. Thank you. Uh, we have time for one final question. And this one uh, this is kind of an open-ended question to the panel, but 
comment comes in. I understand the value of SD-WAN for enterprise applications that are hosted either in the data center or within a cloud provider, um, but what are some of the benefits around SaaS applications that I might want to consider? Uh, sure, so I'll, I'll, I'll hop that. in first. <laughs> um, just to, to reiterate that the SD-WAN solution's ability to selectively direct cloud-bound traffic, so all those SaaS applications, uh, selectively direct that out of enterprise branches and through the internet to the, the solution, the SaaS solution, um, makes it uh, very attractive for folks who need to optimize the performance of SaaS applications because uh, you really are getting all of your own WAN out of the way and taking advantage of the SaaS provider's infrastructure without giving up security. You can always route stuff back through uh, an internet hub or your data center if it needs to go through some additional security to get to that particular SaaS solution, or if it's a SaaS solution you don't fully trust yet. But you know, typically for sanctioned SaaS applications, getting the WAN out of the way is often the most useful thing you can do. Great, Andy, what's your perspective? Yeah, certainly the segmentation, the breakout, as we like to call it, from the branch where you're bypassing the data center, sending internet SaaS bound traffic directly to its destination is a first step. But I would say at Citrix, we take it one step further. So we have the service that we call the cloud direct service. And it essentially almost mirrors the same capabilities of SD-WAN with a customer, if they were to deploy a SD-WAN in, let's say AWS or Azure, or a SD-WAN appliance in the data center, we're basically extending those capabilities to a SaaS property. And so that is via our cloud direct service. Obviously customers can't put an SD-WAN appliance in a salesforce.com cloud, in a Zoom cloud as an example. But with this cloud service, we are able to offer that resiliency, that visibility and performance as if a customer was managing their end-to-end -end, um, SD-WAN into SaaS cloud. And so that is available to customers. Got it, thank you. Uh, so we're getting uh, toward the end here. We got a couple of minutes left. Uh, Andy, you got a couple of uh, uh, tips that you can share with our audience and our listeners, things they can bring back to the office, you know, kind of immediately put into action uh, if they're considering moving toward SD-WAN. Can you share those with us? Absolutely. And <clears throat> so great perspective from Dave, as far as, you know, some of the challenges he walked into, but, you know, our encouragement to customers and prospects as they look at SD-WAN is, Number one, understand what project goals are. So is it optimization of the network? Is it WAN performance? Is it application performance? Is it ROI? Oftentimes these things are very much intertwined. Um, is it extending the network into the cloud? Is it migrating applications away from a legacy data center into the cloud? Oftentimes also security is part of that. And so identifying what these specific goals are is a great first step. <clears throat> Secondly, understand what's needed from a application performance standpoint. <clears throat> Many of our customers have applications that reside in data centers and for various reasons, they may take longer than the next six months to actually move into the cloud. And so the reality is there's gonna be this hybridicity of application residents, both in cloud environments as well as in data centers. And so understanding this and designing the SD-WAN <clears throat> to optimize for that type of environment is important. Also understanding, is this a 100% do-it-yourself type project, as in the case of Dave and Northside, where they had the expertise, they have the resources, or is it a situation where it might be a medium-sized business or a small business who doesn't necessarily have the budget or resources to manage multiple service providers, contracts? They don't have the ability to do the integration and migration of applications. And so that's where, service providers, systems integrators come into play and can certainly assist <clears throat> with the migration over to SD-WAN. Thirdly, like Dave, uh, fourthly rather, identify those top vendors 
uh, whether on paper or through word of mouth, um, who would likely fit the requirements or meet the requirements of your project. And I would say from a vendor perspective, don't take the marketing at face value. Do the due diligence, do the research, and understand what those true capabilities are. And lastly, as you extend that into a lab environment, run the pilot because that's where you ultimately see, does a solution perform as specified in the marketing materials and what those actual gotchas are? And so, you know, a lab, a PLC is gonna give teams more insight than any amount of technical documentation or marketing that is available. Great, thanks a lot, Andy. Uh, great advice for our audience. Uh, so in closing, uh, I wanna thank again, John, uh, Andy, and Dave for your time, uh, your insights and your discussion here uh, this afternoon. Um, I wanna thank our listeners. Um, thank you for joining us and your participation. I'm sorry we didn't get to all the questions, uh, but we can certainly get those to you uh, post, uh, post webcast uh, and follow up with you there. Uh, we appreciate your time and hope you found this to be valuable as well. Uh, shortly, a survey will appear on your screen. Uh, we would love to hear from you. Uh, so we can make uh, make uh, improvements and adjustments to continue to uh, provide you with better programming down the future. Uh, and as a further incentive uh, to complete that survey, uh, everyone that submits a completed survey with your contact information is eligible to win an Amazon Echo Show. Uh, so for that, I want to say thank you very much and have a great day.